For centuries, it's been debated. Nature or nurture? Are you the way that you are simply because of your DNA? Or is it a matter of socialization, the way that you were raised, how you were formed to be? At this point in time, I think it's fair to say that most reasonable people consider it to be a combination of the two. For some people, perhaps nature has a greater influence. If you're neurodivergent, for example, that can absolutely shape the way you move through the world. For others, it may be more an issue of nurture or lack thereof. If you have BPD, for example, you only have it because you've experienced some sort of major trauma in your childhood. And therefore, the trajectory your genes alone put you on has now been rerouted. But where did children who commit violence factor into all of this? When most people think of the concept of a childhood, they associate it with innocence, simpler times, moments in your life when you had less responsibilities, where there weren't such heavy consequences. And when you think of children who commit extreme acts of violence or even murder, that naturally disrupts that image. And when people think of kids who are serial killers, they're naturally very afraid. It's a situation where all the right things went very wrong. But what about child soldiers? There's a much different cultural reaction to that. They feel bad for them. They know it's not inherent to childhood to pick up a weapon and mobilize. It's completely unnatural. It's clearly a situation where adults have taken adult problems and placed them on the shoulders of the children around them. And that's exactly what happened after Ervil LeBaron's death. If you haven't seen part one, you're going to want to watch that first before you proceed further into this video. I will link part one below in the description. Today's video is going to be part two of the Mormon Manson story of Ervil LeBaron. Where we last left off, he had just died in his prison cell. And all of his manuscripts, all of his writings, all of his newer, exceedingly more violent revelations have been released to the public for the first time and compiled into a brand new book. The Book of the New Covenant. This book, or as those who belong to Ervil LeBaron's cult viewed it, this religious testimony, included revelations that were increasingly violent, a ranking system of who would take over for Ervil, and in the event of their death, who would take over for them, and of course, a hit list of all those that Ervil felt had wronged him, with very clear instructions that he expected his flock to take over on his behalf. Hi guys, welcome back for part two. And this is actually being posted on a spooky Saturday. My last one was not posted on a Saturday. It was supposed to be in the middle of the week. It doesn't even make sense. If you guys have been subscribed and you've been watching all these videos, I seriously really appreciate it because I was worried I didn't post for, for two weeks because I was doing stuff for the podcast and I was like, oh my God, everyone's going to be disappointed. They're not going to care anymore. But you guys all came back. Like seriously, I really appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed yet, I would appreciate that too, but like no pressure. If you're here because you enjoyed part one, thank you for coming to part two. At the end of part one, I talked about how Ervold's flock had seen a massive shift in his personality. A lot of the adult members had felt alienated from the cult. They didn't want to be involved anymore, not only because of the things that they saw at court, but because they just saw what a huge shift there was in the content of the revelations. They knew that like Ervil was clearly not in his right mind, which is saying a lot because Ervil had always been a sort of heinous figure in their lives, whether they were aware of that or not. And the same is certainly true for Ervil's older children. Just like the adults, a lot of them were witnessing this shift. A lot of them were seeing their siblings turn on Ervil or run away. And basically they were wising up to the fact that their family was clearly not like other families, and maybe, just maybe, there was a reason for that. Unfortunately, Ervil had children of all ages. His older kids aren't the only kids that he had. He also had younger children who, in the grand scheme of their lives, had only known Ervil from the trial forward. 
So they didn't see the shift in his demeanor. They didn't see the shift in his revelations or his scripture. From what they knew, he was always the way that he was up until right before his death. And just like the older children were groomed to see him as a prophet and consider his word to be law, the younger children were indoctrinated with that very same sense, only they were always being given this incredibly extreme scripture, which is saying a lot because Ervil's previous revelations were also what most rational people would consider to be very extreme. These children were quite literally groomed to kill. And while a lot of the older children were groomed to assassinate people on Ervil's behalf and be killers in their own right, the younger children were truly groomed to act as a military force. All of them, over the course of their entire lives, had been forged into living weapons, in essence. And in 1981, after Ervil's death, his flock essentially splinters into four groups. First and foremost is the people who want nothing to do with it anymore. They leave, they just become your typical private citizen. Then there's Mark Chinoth, who is the guy who turned himself in so that he could testify on Rena's behalf in front of his children with his hands up, smiling at them, telling them, hey, it's okay, don't worry about it, so that they're not traumatized by his border patrol arrest. The third group is unsurprisingly run by Dan Jordan. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people saw it coming, that Dan would eventually splinter off and want to do his own thing. It's unsurprising that he would end up being fed up with acting as Ervil's general because at that point, why not just start your own army? And then fourth was Arturo LeBaron, who was Ervil's teenage son. And he was the one who in the Book of the New Covenant was actually named by Ervil to take over the cult for Ervil. And so Arturo names his new group the Kingdom of God and calls it the KOG for short. He and most of Ervil's other teenage children are living out in Mexico on a ranch, a ranch called Rancho La Jora. And Arturo had a lot of overlap with the local narcos. He had befriended a lot of them. And although he was living this super religious life in one sense, he was also living this sort of like criminal enterprise in the other. And the KOG is heavily influenced by that. And it starts functioning more like a criminal enterprise, almost like a cartel. But rather than getting into the drug trade, what Arturo does is he creates an auto theft ring. So they steal cars from America, bring them over the border and either scrap them or resell them. And he actually does team up with some of the local narcos to get this ring going. Initially, it's all running pretty smoothly. He's getting along with the narcos. Everybody's getting a fair cut. The cult is going well, if you can even say that. I mean, it's going according to plan, I guess is a better phrasing. But one of the followers of this cult, i.e. one of Arturo's siblings, doesn't like the way that Arturo is running it and they're not named specifically, but they start having more and more friction and eventually Arturo is shot and killed by this follower. And in the event that something like this happens in the book of the new covenant, Ervil has a list of heirs in order. So the next person in line after Arturo is his son Heber. When Heber was a child, he was actually known for his sensitivity. He was always very gentle. His siblings really loved him. They felt that he was one of the more emotionally intelligent of the group. But they said that once he was moved to Colorado and forced to start working under Dan Jordan as a child, there was a notable shift in his personality. He started to get more agitated, he was a little colder, and by the time he was a teenager, he was partying nonstop. It definitely seems like he was trying to self-medicate or self-soothe. And at a certain point, he's moved back down to Mexico, and then his partying is only getting more intense. He starts partying with the local narcos, he's getting into drugs, he's drinking all the time. And while he's in the sort of upswing of his party boy era, he suddenly inherits the cult. And Heber is definitely not that sweet little boy anymore, unfortunately. If every child starts out as a lump of clay and they've yet to be molded by their experiences, it's fair to say that by this point in Heber's life, he had been sharpened into a spear because his first official order was that Arturo's death needs to be avenged. He takes an even more violent approach to this already very violent group. He starts training the militia 10 times as hard. He starts getting the younger kids involved and pretty young kids were already involved in the militia training, but he drops the age requirement down to six. 
And I don't mean like pacer tests, six-year-olds doing push-ups and sit-ups. I mean six-year-olds training with semi-automatic weapons. And more importantly, Heber didn't actually know exactly who had killed Arturo, so he was just going off of his own suspicions, and he didn't suspect any one person, so he ended up killing multiple people that he thought could have potentially been the one to kill Arturo. Mind you, only one person actually did kill Arturo, and it's not even clear if he ever actually got the killer. Unsurprisingly, the death toll on the ranch starts climbing incredibly quickly. In fact, Heber would actually kill anybody who wandered too close to the property's perimeter out of fear that they were trying to run away. And to bring in extra money, he actually starts prostituting the women on the compound, which the women on the compound are his sisters. And once he starts doing that, incest, starts becoming incredibly commonplace on the compound. I suspect just with the sheer number of children that have been in this cult, incest was likely already a problem, whether or not it was openly discussed, openly spoken about is a completely different thing. I just think statistically it would be ignorant to assume that no incest is happening, but this is different than that completely because incest was rampant. Meanwhile, Mark Chenoweth's branch is located in Houston, and they are still technically a cult, but it's sort of a unique situation. I think actually they fall more under the category of a highly controlled group, which is like a precursor to being a cult, because although they were still following a lot of the same rules, and they were still very devout, and they certainly kept to themselves and really just their group, Mark's entire like purpose of the cult was to make sure that everyone had as normal a life as possible. He was almost trying to create like a cult halfway house, almost more than an actual cult, because it didn't appear that he was trying to control anybody so much as he was trying to support. And everybody who was with Dan during this time attests to the fact that it was the happiest time of their lives and it was the most normal time of their lives. So he was certainly achieving his goal of trying to give everyone the life that they really should have had all along. A lot of the kids who Ervil had pulled out of school, either so that they could work more or as a result of some sort of punishment, was re-enrolling in school and making sure that they got their degrees and making sure that they graduated. And again, he was the only man from the cult who only had one wife. But unfortunately, one fateful day, they would receive a knock on the door. And when they opened up, they would see Dan Jordan on the other side. See, Dan had come down from Colorado to Houston because he was trying to poach Mark's followers because Dan had a real supply chain problem. He didn't have enough people working in his appliance shop and that was his sole motivation for trying to get people who were living with Mark to come up to Colorado. Dan knew that Mark, his wife, and their five children weren't the only ones from the cult who were living there. So he tried to appeal to anybody who wasn't directly related to Mark first. Because Dan suspected, and he was correct in this, that Mark and his immediate family were trying their absolute best to distance themselves from the cult without doing it so overtly that they would put themselves at risk for assassination. At first, Dan had tried to start a mission to bring in more money to his cult, and it was sort of working, but it wasn't making anywhere near enough money to make up for the deficit from his appliance shop. And that's what had ultimately pushed him to go down to Houston. Dan's entire approach to the mission was to try and convert Latter-day Saints into following his beliefs. He thought that the belief system was close enough that he would be able to convert people with relative ease, but as it turned out, he wasn't converting anywhere near enough people for it to actually make any significant money. And because of this, Dan started to lash out at his followers, accusing the wives and the children of not converting as many Latter-day Saints as he thought they should be able to. And anyone who didn't immediately bend to Dan's will, bow down to him, tell him that he was right, they were sorry even though he wasn't right, the reason they weren't converting more people was purely because people weren't interested. Anybody who Dan so much as suspected of thinking that he was wrong would end up receiving violent lashes. 
And while Mark was spending all of his time in Houston bonding with the children of the cult, not only his biological children, but just all of the children who had been through this horrible experience together, Dan was certainly the opposite. He essentially ignored the children aside from barking orders at them when it came to the appliance shop, aside from one event every year, which was his annual deer hunt. It was important to Dan that the children hunt because he felt that it normalized the concept of death and killing and that ultimately when they would have to make the transition to killing people, it would be easier on them if they were already used to killing animals. So he felt that the annual deer hunt was an effective way of desensitizing the kids. On top of that, part of the lore in the cult was that during the end of days they would have to recede into the mountain and live off the land for a while. And so this played directly into that as a very practical measure for how to live off the land. Can you hunt? Can you survive? Meanwhile, down in Mexico, things with Heber are not going well. He's still partying like crazy. He's getting increasingly more violent. He's paranoid. He's not thinking things through. He's just lashing out. And overall, he's losing the trust of the group pretty quickly. Like I said earlier, the cult was making all of their money from this auto theft ring that they had. And so the auto shop was integral to this process. Keeper's brother, Andrew, ran that auto shop. And his role was pretty irreplaceable. There were other kids who knew how to do certain things in the auto shop, of course, because they were all working together, but nobody really understood the ring the way Andrew did. The auto shop literally relied on Andrew. Without him, it was nothing. Which is why when Heber lashed out and killed Andrew, it caused major problems within the group. Not only were people upset because, again, this is just another example of seemingly senseless violence from Heber, but the cult now had no real way to make money. The auto shop could not run without Andrew and Heber didn't know how to take Andrew's place either. So he couldn't exactly make up for his mistake. And it's at this point that the followers force Heber to step down. His brother Aaron takes over with the caveat that Heber would still have a high ranking position. He would act as his right hand man, which Heber did seem to be genuinely happy with. He still got to act out his violent tendencies so long as Aaron gave the go ahead, but he didn't have to deal with the weight and responsibility of keeping everyone in the cult alive. The second Aaron takes over, there are major changes. He focuses way more on the religious angle. He brings back praying multiple times a day. He's smart. He knows the scripture, and most importantly, he knows the hit list, and it is his primary focus. Aaron, like everyone else in the cult, considers Ervil's word to be law, and Ervil's main focus was this hit list, and therefore it was paramount to Aaron. The intensified military training that Heber had implemented continues on. But now the children are being taught to shoot in the chest twice and in the head once to ensure that their targets are dead. And Aaron, with Heber as his second, begins to focus on the first name from Ervil LeBaron's hit list. Dan Jordan. The plan is simple. They're going to go up to Colorado they're gonna show up on Dan Jordan's front doorstep just a couple weeks before the annual deer hunt. And they're going to ask if they can join his cult. They're gonna explain that things have gone south in Mexico, they can't do it on their own, and they require him to lead their flock. And they do it. When they get up to Colorado, Dan is skeptical. But like I said, he needs those numbers. He needs those workers. So although he doesn't trust these kids, he does allow them to enter his group. But once he does, he is highly suspicious of them at all times. He's never without his gun. And the kids who have been in Dan Jordan's group up until this point, when they meet the KOG kids and start talking to them as they're doing their work, they're also realizing that these kids are different. These kids are intense. These kids grew up doing training exercises that they hadn't done with Dan. And Dan also had a militia training program. So that just speaks to how much more severe the KOG's militia program was if Dan Jordan's kids thought that it was extreme. So they go out on the annual deer hunt 
and naturally all of the KOG kids are invited as well. They're all out there and then suddenly nature calls. Dan's gotta pee. So he goes out to do his business and for the first time since these kids had joined his group, he forgets to bring his gun. Goes out into the forest line, but no one follows him. They're all busy. There's actually people from outside of the cult present at this point in time, and so everyone is distracted with them. No one was with Dan Jordan. And that's why I was so surprising when they heard the gunshots. One of Dan's older kids runs after him into the woods and then quickly returns and gathers everybody up and says, dad's dead, we've got to go. It's not long before the police show up because like I said, there were people from outside the cult present when all of this happened. So the police get there, they round everybody up, they start questioning everybody and it becomes very quickly apparent that nobody witnessed the murder, nobody was unaccounted for, Dan just somehow died from what was clearly not a self-inflicted gunshot wound on top of the fact that he didn't even have his gun with him. So who did it? Well, after talking to everybody for a while, the cops realize that half of these kids are not Dan Jordan's kids, they're Irville LeBaron's kids. So they immediately know how dangerous these kids are. And when they start talking to Aaron in particular, they feel like he's highly suspicious and yet, he's accounted for by people who aren't in the cult. So after they talk to everybody, no one ends up being arrested in connection with Dan. There's just not enough evidence. And that's because everyone had left Mexico and gone up to Colorado so that they could move in with Dan Jordan. That is everyone except Heber. Heber had been left behind in Mexico strategically so that once they got up to Dan Jordan's and had successfully infiltrated his cult, they just had to sit and wait until the annual deer hunting trip would come around. And at that point, Aaron could call Heber, instruct him to come up to Colorado so that he could arrive upon the campsite, lie in wait, and when an opportunity presented itself, kill Dan Jordan. From an outsider looking in, it doesn't make any sense. Everyone who they knew to be in Colorado was accounted for, so there's no one to suspect. And that's just because they didn't know Heber was in Colorado at all. Now in part one, I quoted JFK saying that you can kill a man, but not his ideas. And that is certainly the case with Irva LeBaron and the KOG because Six years after his death, they're still working through his hit list. All of a sudden, Aaron vanishes. Nobody knows where he is. He's completely unaccounted for. And everybody from the other groups after Dan Jordan's death, seeing that the KOG took down such a Goliath, somebody that everybody else in Herbal's cult had previously feared, now paranoia is higher than ever. The cops know that more killings are to come, Mark knows that more killings are to come. And so he sits down his kids and he calmly tells them, listen, I'm on the hit list and Dan Jordan has been killed. And he was also on the hit list. And I think that we need to start carrying weapons because I don't know how many potential casualties there could be in this and we all need to be very careful. The children are scared. They know how serious this hit list is, and they trust that their dad wouldn't be saying this unless it was truly unavoidable. Then June 27th happened. At 4 p.m., a man in a blue suit with a beard stepped out of a black Silverado, but he didn't just shoot Mark. He also shot Eddie. And he didn't just shoot Mark and Eddie, he also shot Dwayne and his young daughter, who just happened to be with him. All of them were shot and killed by a man with a black Silverado and a beard wearing a blue suit at 4 p.m. But they were all shot by that same man with that same suit and that same beard and that same car 
at the same time in three completely different locations on the same day. It didn't make any sense. The police are getting radio calls of this same person seemingly cloned in three different locations at the exact same time in the exact same outfit, the exact same car, killing four completely different people. This isn't some sort of teleportation machine. It's not actual clones. It's different men wearing the exact same disguise with the exact same make, model, and color of stolen car. But the problem was because their descriptions were exactly the same, it made it almost impossible for the cops to actually match a description with an actual ID. It didn't matter that all these crimes happened in broad daylight. In fact, Dwayne's daughter was shot in the face in broad daylight because she was screaming and crying after she had seen her father get assassinated in front of her and they just wanted her to be quiet. So despite the fact that this happened in public, there were no fingerprints, there was no ID, they knew who ordered it, but they couldn't arrest him because he was dead and had been dead for six years. It was Ervil's hit list, but who actually performed the hit? On top of the blatant horror of this situation, it's actually so much worse if you know anything about Mormonism because 4 p.m. is a very significant time within the Mormon faith. It's the exact time that Joseph Smith was killed by a mob. So the fact that these executions were performed in tandem at 4 p.m. was a very direct reference to that. And these assassinations would be dubbed the four o'clock murders. Houston has had its fair share of issues with crime. I lived in Houston for years, I know that firsthand, but these murders in particular were so shocking, so organized, so unique, so deviously ingenious that it really immediately terrified the public. People also believed that Mark's wife Lillian was one of the intended targets as well and was likely expected to be with Mark and so she was now under threat of being killed at a different time. And of course on top of that a child had now been killed so HPD was worried that this meant that all of the children were potentially on the table either due to just being in the wrong place at the wrong time or maybe even darker they might be intentional targets themselves. And as far as the hit list goes, Ervil doesn't display any sort of allegiance to anyone. Not only are former friends on the list, former family members, but also former wives. His wife Anna Mae was on the list and she knew this. So she had instructed all of her children to hold guns at all times out of fear that somebody would come to kill her. They would post up by the second story window and they were instructed that if they saw any family members come to the front door, that they should shoot first and ask questions later. And of course, just like Rulin's funeral, authorities were worried that the funerals for the four o'clock murders would be an absolute bloodbath because Rulin's was intended to be an assassination of Verlin at the very least. So clearly funerals were on the table. So they set up an FBI perimeter, they had snipers in the trees, and the vast majority of the family members who attended the funeral were immediately put in witness protection after the funeral was over and issued new IDs. And later this week in 1988 in Arizona, there was an anonymous tip about suspicious teens hanging around a motel. When the cops first arrived, they saw that there was a group of seemingly clean cut teens, but that they all had stolen vehicles. And so initially they thought that that's what this case was gonna be about with these kids in this Arizona motel. This is just a, an issue of Grand Theft Auto. But upon closer inspection, they saw that there were newspapers inside these cars detailing the four o'clock murders. They saw that there was a map of Houston, Texas. And on that map was a location circled, which just so happened to be exactly where Dwayne was killed. And they even found the disguises from the assassinations 
within these cars. So while the teens were arrested in Arizona on auto theft charges, Phoenix PD ended up contacting Houston PD just a week into holding these kids. And at that point they realized that they had Heber in their custody. Now you might be thinking, this is awesome. They're gonna be held accountable, right? Sort of, maybe not right. I mean, this case, it seems clear cut, right? These are the guys who did it. We know why they did it. We have them. We have evidence of them doing it. That's all you need, right? In their custody, they had Heber, they had Richard, and they had Doug. And there were two problems here. First problem, not that big of a problem, was that one of the three was still underage. But the bigger problem in this case, and the thing that makes it very clear just how methodically and the thing that makes it very clear just how well thought out these assassinations actually were is that U.S. law requires you to prove which killer committed which assassination. Obviously, that presents an obvious problem in this case because they all look exactly the same. They all have the same description and none of them are going to come forward and say, I did this one, he did that one. Due to their cloning tactic, it was basically impossible. And they knew that. So when the three were charged with auto theft, they pled guilty. They didn't even bother fighting that case because it was the lesser of two evils. And they all got extremely short sentences. Heber and Doug got 10 years. That sounds kind of long, but in Arizona at that time, no one was expected to actually serve more than half of their sentence. So they were effectively given five. And then, and then Richard was only given 2.5 because he was still underage. So he's gonna be serving barely any time. So Heber, Richard, and Doug served time for auto theft, but they didn't serve any time for murder because they had found a clever loophole in our legal system. They had effectively gotten away with it, even though everyone knew it was them. They didn't even have to deny it was them. They just had to maintain the ambiguity of which one of them did what. But it's at this point that there's a little bit of a break. One of Herbal's daughters, Cynthia, calls the police from Mexico and she says that she has dirt on the family and she has dirt on the four o'clock murders. Investigators, of course, jump on this immediately. They offer her a deal. You will not face any repercussions for any involvement in anything that the cult has done if you can tell us which one of the boys did which assassination. And lucky for them, Cynthia was the lookout for the four o'clock murders. So she knew exactly which person had committed which crime. And on top of that, the cops actually didn't know that Aaron was the one running the cult, not Heber, until Cynthia told them. They thought that Heber was the leader. Meanwhile, Heber was essentially nothing more than a hitman at this point. Cynthia detailed how the four o'clock murders had been planned out meticulously for two years. And she had sat in on every single one of those meetings. So her information was truly invaluable. She also admitted that KOG members were the ones who killed Dan, that they had played on what seemed to be his sympathy when in reality it was his desperation for more workers so that they could get accepted into the cult. She explained how Heber was hiding in Mexico until Aaron gave the go ahead to come up to Colorado and take Dan Jordan out. And of course, after giving the police all of this information, Cynthia was immediately put into witness protection. Burr and Doug, who had effectively gotten away with this crime, were now given life in prison after Cynthia's in-person testimony. And Robert, who was still a minor, was given five years. But while all of this is happening, Aaron, is still free down in Mexico. And after this massive case, Mexico finally agrees to arrest Aaron and extradite him to the US. They successfully apprehend Aaron and extradite him to the United States, at which point he is given 45 years for being the intellectual author of these assassinations, just like his father before him. Because of this cult, 
Over the course of 30 years, 33 people were killed, nine people committed, and countless others suffered. There are two people who committed that I want to highlight really quick because I did cover them in part one. First was Isaac LeBaron who testified against Ervil in person in court and was ultimately the reason that Ervil was sentenced to prison. Just two years after he gave that testimony, he would end up taking his own life, which is truly tragic. It's obvious that he had experienced true horrors at the hands of this cult and Eventually, it got to a point where it just overwhelmed him and he didn't want to feel those feelings anymore. The second I would like to highlight is Mark's wife, Lillian. After Mark was assassinated, Lillian continued to take care of their five children, as well as children who belonged to Dan and Ervil, who had effectively been adopted by Mark and Lillian. But she was just never the same. She took Mark's suicide incredibly hard. He was the love of her life and it left a huge hole in her heart that she was just never able to reconcile with, unfortunately. And because of this, she would end up taking her own life. And there is a moment in all of this that I feel like really encapsulates the damage that a cult can do. And that is actually a letter that Heber wrote from prison to Mark and Lillian's children. Heber, as I mentioned before, was originally a very sensitive and emotionally intelligent boy who was just absolutely corrupted by what he experienced at the hands of this cult and Dan Jordan specifically. And it contorted him into a person that I don't think he was actually intended to be. And in his letter to Mark and Lillian's children, he took accountability for killing their father, Mark, and he also took accountability for ultimately killing Lillian as well, because Lillian was unable to live on without Mark in her life. And Heber recognized that that was a direct result of his actions. And although saying sorry is certainly not enough for the damage that Heber inflicted on countless lives, I feel like when he was finally taken away from all of that craziness, when he was put into prison and he was forced to sit with his own thoughts, it's abundantly clear that he was really remorseful. And it's sad because you can't take back the things that Heber had done. You can't take back the things that Ervil had done, or countless other people involved in this story who had done horrible, terrible things. And it's unfortunate because a lot of these people, were it not for this cult, would have probably gone on to live very normal lives. They may have even positively affected those around them. But because of the influence of this cult, we'll never know whether or not that would have been the case. If you made it all the way to the end of part two, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And let me know down below, do you think this is a situation of nature, nurture? Can people who have done the things that Heber and Aaron and all of the other children who were raised under the influence of Ervil's more violent sermon are beyond rehabilitation. I'd be interested to see your opinions. And don't forget, the podcast is coming out. I hope that you guys like it. I'm very excited. And if you don't follow me on TikTok, you should check out my TikTok and Instagram. My TikTok is Daisy Foco and my Instagram is Daisy Foco. All right, good night, guys. Bye.